you so much to Zoomix. Good evening, everyone. My name is Julie Burroughs. I'm the Chief of Arts and Culture for the City of Boston. I have the great pleasure of serving Mayor Walsh in this capacity. And we're so excited to share with you tonight um, some information about Boston Creates, our third town hall. And I want to also the mic's not on. Oh, the mic's not on. Oh. Not on? Am I on now? I mean, I need a boost in volume. Um, and thank you to the Bunker Hill Community College staff. They've been phenomenal. And you're going to see this is this great tech setup. Um, and I also want to thank the whole entire Boston Creates team and all my staff at the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture for helping to put everything together and make this a reality tonight. We're going to share some information with you and have some questions and answers, do some polling. Um, we'll get you all set up with the technology. It should be really fun. Um, and the other thing I wanted to tell you right from the beginning is you're going to see these really cool photographs throughout the presentation, and they're all by uh, Leo March, who was one of the artists who was embedded in the process. And so this is his photography, and it's an illustration, his view of what the cultural life of Boston looked like while we were carrying out the public engagement phase of the Boston Creates Cultural Plan. Um, so I just wanted to start out by saying that this is a very unique moment for Boston. Mayor Welsh has committed resources and charged us to think about how Boston can become a municipal arts leader. Um, the city is undertaking its first comprehensive plan in over 50 years and we've been working to create the city's first cultural plan. And we know that Boston uh, has incredible arts and culture institutions, nonprofits, um, commercial entities, artists. We know that Boston is a city that educates and innovates, incubates all kinds of new works, celebrates the arts, and participates in the arts. But most of all, city is a, Boston is a city that creates. Our name, Boston Creates, really embraces the fact that we have a wealth of creative people here in Boston work at a, a very high professional level in all different kinds of arts genres, but also who work um, in cultural expression at an amateur level or an avocational level and have a real um, personal connection to how arts and culture can really transform us. With the Boston Creates Plan, we really want to see how can we harness the power of creative thought to solve our problems, both great and small. We started that out with a community engagement process. And last June, we had our first big town hall meeting. And many of you participated, whether you were on the steering committee, or the leadership council, or you headed up a community team, or participated in a conversation. Maybe you took the survey. Maybe you came to a focus group. Maybe you just encountered Boston Creates at your farmer's market or at an event. But we know many of, the, of you in the room participated, and we think you'll find your voice reflected in, in our process. So this is just a quick overview, a snapshot really, of what was thousands and thousands of people participating in this very multifaceted and inclusive process. Our steering committee, actually started meeting before I even came to Boston to conceive what were, what were we aiming for in creating a cultural plan? What was the team we needed to bring on board? It was about 15 people. It's half city employees and half leaders in the cultural community. We also, um, now it's on, I can tell. <laughs> We also asked people to um, get involved in community teams. There were 16 teams and a youth team. Many of you are chairs of one of those teams. We've got about 37 people involved as a co-chair of the community team. We've got a 60-person leadership council. 
Um, many people came to town hall meetings, focus groups, 118 community conversations, and over 3,000 people took a survey. The survey was really focused on understanding people's personal engagement in creative expression of all sorts. And we're going to engage you again tonight. When you walked in to the, to the auditorium, hopefully you got a little piece of paper that looked like this. And these are instructions on how to set up your participation in the text message polling we're going to do tonight. So it's very simple. If you have a smartphone or even a dumb phone, what you do is you go to do a text message. And in the two part, instead of putting your friend's name or someone's phone number, you're just gonna put the numbers 22333. So actually, if you all wanna get out your phones, you can test it right now. And then in the message part, you're just gonna type in Boston Creates. I'm gonna go ahead and do it right along with you guys, even though I've already done this once. I'm gonna test it right along. That way we know it's actually working, right? So get your phone, you're gonna do two, right? The numbers, two, two, three, three, three. And then the text message is Boston Creates, all together. Don't spell Boston wrong. Don't let autocorrect mess it up. And then you're just gonna hit send. Sending. And then you should get an auto reply. <laughs> I didn't get mine yet. Did anyone get their reply yet? Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. And it says, oh, I got my reply. I got my reply. It says, you've joined Cara Elliott Ortega, my staff person who set this up. Thank God for her. Um, all right. So you're now ready to take the first question in our poll, and this question is really a test question to get you all set up. So you're gonna answer, what, what creative expression are you the most passionate about? I know we didn't give you that many to choose from, but you're gonna choose one. I'm gonna choose one. Um, and then you just put the letter and you hit send. I don't think it matters if it's uppercase or lowercase. And then the results, hopefully, are gonna show up. Oh, what's happening? <laughs> so this is the result. Wow, all right. It's a constantly changing, constantly changing landscape. Looks like performing arts. Ooh, moving around a little bit. Visual was, uh, was getting out there. Okay, so, so this is how the polling is gonna work. Later on in the presentation, what we're going to do is ask you a few more questions. Now that you've taken one question, for all the next questions, you're just going to put one or two or A or B, um, and it'll be really easy. Um, and so for all you latecomers and stragglers, you're going to get your little instruction sheet and maybe poke the person next to you. If you see a new person come in, you can show them how to do it. Um, so this might continue to change a little bit, and if you have another phone, don't phone twice, okay? Um, all right, so now that the polling um, is, all, is all out of the way, and we know what we're doing with our text messages. Oh, by the way, if you can't do text messages and you don't want to, um, there are pieces of paper, hopefully, that you got handed um, on the way in, and you can just fill that out and check, check, check whatever you want your answers to be, and we'll, we'll tally those up. So, so there's people in the back. I can see Adam way in the back has got pieces of paper. But this looks like a pretty tough, savvy group. Did everyone, anybody not have it work? Oh, you didn't have it work. Well, we'll get you, we'll get you a piece of paper. All right. <laughs> I hear you. All right, so let's get going and talk about um, what did we learn in our in our um, in our very multifaceted, very complicated um, uh, engagement and research phase. Um, we touched upon this at the last town hall meeting, and we collected a tremendous amount of information. Every single meeting that was held 
had a template for notes, submit your notes. All those notes were read and analyzed. And so we have a tremendous amount of qualitative information as well as quantitative information. And we've been synthesizing and synthesizing and synthesizing all that information. And it's very complicated and multifaceted. And this is a summary and sort of the most, um, the most high priority things that we found. Um, so we heard from a lot of people about a lot of silos in arts and culture. There's geographic silos, there's silos between the arts sector and other sectors, there's silos um, between sort of different genres and disciplines of the arts, there's silos within city government um, or the different jurisdictions and layers of, solo, uh, layers of government. Um, we also heard about a lot of barriers, again, very multifaceted, there are barriers to attendance and participation and engagement with arts and culture. They do vary tremendously between different, for example, demographic groups, geography, age groups. Um, so we know that the barriers are very complex. What we learned that we need to overcome these silos and barriers are equitable opportunities for, pe for people to participate and benefit from access uh, to the arts or um, uh, opportunities for creative expression. We heard a lot from organizations and individuals and groups large and small about the challenges with finding space and facilities, occupying that space once they have it, or for indiv individuals finding workspace, affordable housing. And as a matter of fact, we have launched a cultural, a performing arts cultural facilities survey, and you'll hear a little bit more about that in a few minutes. We also heard that youth want more opportunities in school and out of school. They're looking for innovative ways to connect with cultural opportunities. They're looking for a sequential pathway in arts and culture, and we know we need to do a better job in arts and culture for, for youth. We also heard that there's a real desire for better access to information. Again and again, people told us, I only heard about it after it was done. Um, almost every single meeting we're at, we hear about this, and it's a, huge, it's a huge barrier, just better access to information, not only for um, participation and being an audience member, but for connecting to learning opportunities, connecting to networks, professional development, um, how do you get the information that you need? We also heard about the desire for support. Systemic dollars for change. How are we going to grow the supports to the cultural sector? So since we uh, met at the last town hall meeting, we've been analyzing the survey data, the meeting notes, all of the things we heard from the, from the community conversations, we've been synthesizing that together. What are the common themes that we heard again and again? Things that caught across all of the ways we engage people. What are the most urgent issues? What's some of that cause effect? What are some of those sequential things? How are priorities aligning together? And we've been working really hard to coalesce that information into understandable goals, goals that take us from the immediate through 10 years to understand how strategies to achieve those goals, what are some programs, first steps, maybe deeper dives into research we need to do. And we've been testing all of those strategies and goals again and again and again with our <coughs> steering committee, leadership council, arts funders, closely held stakeholders, testing them again and again. Um, and we're happy to share with you tonight what those goals, strategies, and first steps really look like. And we'll ask you to give us your feedback um, a little bit further down in the meeting. So the goals, you know, this was really hard to articulate where do we want to move forward as a city? We really took into account what people told us. 
The strategies you'll see are um, really the top strategies. There probably could have been a hundred different ones. We needed to sort of boil them down into um, things that, that are overarching, ways that we're going to achieve those goals. And first steps are really just a sampling of some of the actions and programs, interventions that we're already taking or that we know we have funding for, thanks to Mayor Walsh and the city budget, which we hope passes, and things that my office um, can do uh, right away. So we've got five key goals, and we're gonna give a quick summary here and then go into detail. And these goals are really the core content of the cultural plan. The goals, strategies, first steps, this is the guts of the plan that we're writing. Um, so let's go to goal one. How can we integrate arts and culture into all aspects of civic life? That could involve these four strategies. Changing city policy making and practice to integrate creative thinking into the work of every municipal department and all planning efforts. How do we harness the power of arts and culture to engage us in a civic discourse, planning, and creative problem solving? How can we make Boston a place where arts education and arts enhanced learning are available citywide and throughout all stages of life, not just for youth, but for adults, young adults, older adults, seniors. How can we integrate arts, culture, and creativity into the public realm and urban environment? And what might this look like? This really looks like, within city government, cross-departmental collaborations. We've been piloting exactly how to bring creative approaches into city government with our Boston Air, AIR, Artists in Residence pilot. Um, we recently announced three artist residencies. We're really excited to see that as a testing ground. How can we transform the work of city government and bring these creative approaches and also create amazing art? We know we have funding for a second round of Boston Air that will be focused on the Boston Center for Youth and Families. We're also working to embed arts into public works. This is really exciting and has the power to possibly transform our public realm. Our poet laureate has been hard at work <laughs> all over the city. Um, one of the things she's done is organize workshops with the Elderly Commission. So we're really looking at how um, we can bring arts and culture into everything we do within city government. Those are just a few examples of what we're doing right now. Goal number two is about creating fertile ground for a vibrant arts and culture ecosystem. Some of those strategies would be to create partnerships, to develop platforms, funding streams, and networks that really enable risk-taking and innovation across arts and culture sectors. We want to support the availability, affordability, and sustainability of cultural spaces and facilities for arts and culture organizations and artists in Boston. We want to strengthen small and mid-sized arts and culture organizations in the city. And we want to enact and coordinate municipal policies to better support creative expression of all kinds of creative endeavors citywide. So what might that look like right away? Well, we've already streamlined the temporary public art permit and process and put this really helpful infographic on our website. We're already undertaking the performing arts facility study that I mentioned a little bit earlier. Goal number three, keeping artists in Boston, recognizing their essential contribution to a thriving, healthy, and innovative city. What's number one? Invest in individual artists in Boston. 
We want to make city government more accessible, welcoming, and responsive to artists. And identify and pursue opportunities for affordable artist housing, as well as presenting and production spaces. And what are some first steps that we're taking? Our Boston Cultural Council is going to begin making grants to artists this year and then much more robust, robustly in the next fiscal year. As a matter of fact, our application for scholarships for the Americans to the Arts uh, Convention is open right now. I want to make this a little plug for that. And then the other thing we're really excited about creating within our office is an artist resource function. This is a person, a web presence, and someone who's available to artists and arts nonprofits to help them navigate through City Hall, help them find the resources, aggregate that information that's already out there. We're really excited that this is gonna be a fantastic resource to artists and nonprofits and commercial arts entrepreneurs. <coughs> Goal number four, mobilize likely and unlikely partners to generate excitement, demand, and resources for Boston's arts and cultural <coughs> sector. How do we cultivate and mobilize, mobilize public support and advocacy for the arts and culture sector? We can utilize the convening power of city government and partners to motivate and assist other sectors and professional groups in advocating for arts and culture. We can develop partnerships and tools necessary to make Boston a leading cultural destination, more so than it already is, no disrespect to our incredible arts organizations we have now, but we can do more. We know that there's potential to grow. And how do we cultivate greater foundation, corporate, and individual philanthropy and advance public-private sector partnerships to support the city's goals for the arts and culture sector. We're already seeing there's an incredible amount of momentum building off of the convenings that we've been doing as part of the Boston Creates process. People in the healthcare sector, universities, and the arts funders, they told us how they hadn't been in a room together and they were really excited to explore the possibilities of working together towards a common goal. And finally, goal number five. And I also want to say, even though this is goal number five, these are not in priority order. There's no hierarchy here. I'm just numbering them out of convenience, but um, it is absolutely not any kind of hierarchical order. Um, goal number five, um, cultivate a city where all cultural expressions are respected and equitably resourced and where arts and culture are accessible to all. How might we do that? Well, we start by addressing cultural disparities across race, class, ability, and geographic lines by intentionally bridging divides and promoting cross-cultural exchange. We want to advance equity by facilitating creative, cultural, and artistic opportunities in historically underserved communities. We want to leverage city departments, resources, and facilities to embed arts and culture opportunities in every neighborhood. And we want to increase cultural competency in, arts, in the arts and culture sector, facilitate learning opportunities for diverse populations, and promote diverse and inclusive participation in the sector. And how are we going to achieve this? Well, partially we can start to get at it by our grant making, being very intentional and strategic, making sure we outreach and we're as inclusive as, inclusive as possible. Our, our chief resiliency officer is working now with us on what role arts and culture can play in resilience and equity. And research is definitely part of this. The city has just released an economic inclusion and equity agenda just about a week ago. And so we know we've got a lot of work to do. I wanted to open it up to questions. This is a lot of information that I've covered relatively quickly. 
We are going to make these slides available on the Boston Creates website right after this. <laughs> and the recording of the live stream of this town hall will also be available. So anyone you know who might have missed this presentation can watch it um, on our website. Um, so with that, I think we have a mic in the audience. I wondered if there were any questions. Maybe just raise your hand and we'll recognize you. Over here. Way over there. I don't need a mic. You don't need a mic? All right, I will repeat the question for our recording. Our, our, for our recording. Okay, if you want to go ahead. So my son is in kindergarten at a BPS school, and already the parent council is 100% responsible for raising funds to have most of the arts programming that comes into the school. And then we found out that next year, our art teacher that comes in this year, two days a week, will only be coming in one day. So we have to raise more money to have a partnership with an arts program so that our children can have a well-rounded education. And so my question is, how will these goals and this plan help things in Boston like the Boston Public School System and the children in that way? Yep. Thanks for your question. The question was about her school in particular is seeing some shifts and changes in funding and perhaps a loss of arts programming in the school. And so how can the plan address um, bringing the arts into the school? So we have on our steering committee, Myron Parker Brass, who's the head of arts education for BPS. And I'm a part of the arts education um, advisory committee council body I'm not sure its exact name so we are on each other's committees purposely for coordination and integration and we can look into the situation in your particular school but I do know that in the last six years at Vesters and BPS has been able to increase the average number of minutes that I know it's 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 not the, the issue is I know we've made a ton of gains in elementary schools, but it does differ from school to school. Well, so what so what if please I'll, I'll, let me finish. What we're really trying to do is grow the pie. There's a limit. There have been a limited number of dollars for arts education, so we're trying to bring together partners and grow the funding. BPS already has a fantastic arts education policy. It's just a matter of building out the systems so that we can have every kid in every grade get access to every arts genre. Now that said, this is gonna take time. There are some structural issues with the BPS budget, as you know, and I'm sure you've been reading about and hearing about. So I don't have an answer or a solution for your particular school situation, but the whole intent of this plan is to pull together resources and partners so that we can move the needle on every school. And I just want to be clear, it's not just our school. Yep. Our neighbor goes to the DPS school down the street and they lost their music teacher completely for next year. Um, yeah, I mean, I think so you're just, yeah, I, mean, I understand. I think you're illustrating yeah. how much work we need to do. Yeah. And we heard that loud and clear in our process. And here's the thing about a cultural plan. So my favorite metaphor, I'm not going to claim credit for it as a colleague who said this, doing a cultural plan, it's like taking your car for a diagnostic. It identifies all the work that you need to do, then you issue the plan, and you get to work, then you get to work and you do the work that the plan identifies that you need to do. So as much as we're trying to have solutions and programs and funding and partnerships in place, before we issue the plan so that we can announce them when we issue the plan. We've got a ton of work to do once we issue the plan. And, and BPS, it's a big system. And we know that there are tremendous inequities. So that is, that is absolutely part of what we heard in our process. 
and it's it's very it, and it shows up in our goals and our strategies and, and and we would love to be working with as many partners as we can possibly identify so we we've heard people loud and clear but we're not going to fix it in one year we're going to need time I think we might need the microphone for this one. So, now speaking of partnerships, what sort of ideas do you have to create partnerships with the community surrounding Boston, mm. the greater Boston area? Yeah, the question was, what were the approaches for partnerships with communities surrounding Boston? So I do want you to know that the performing arts facility study is not just Boston, but it's Boston and surrounding communities, Cambridge, Somerville, Chelsea. So our wonderful friends across the border, please take the facility survey. Um, the other thing we recognize is the importance of implementation that is partnership funded. We know that our city dollars in the city of Boston aren't going to be able to be granted outside of the city unless they do programs in the city. And that's why we're really looking at funding and implementation solutions that are perhaps pooled funds or um, partnerships that might have a wider geography. So for example, there's an artist survey that's going to be launched by NEFA that's not only Boston, but actually all of New England. We know that there are definitely some grant programs that are within the 495 um, highway boundary, I guess you would call it. The other thing we've been doing is working with the MAPC, the Metropolitan Area Planning Council, and we've been meeting with what they would call an intercore group of, I think it's 12 um, municipalities, and we've been working actually on an arts and culture toolkit. We have a sort of a working group, um, and we've been sharing a lot of best practices, and there will be this web arts, arts and planning web toolkit, because we know that many of the surrounding communities don't have um, an arts commissioner as part of city government. It's actually the planning staff who are carrying out public art and murals and that kind of thing. Arts Council is all volunteer. So we've actually all been working together on this toolkit um, to help everyone gain access to information and best practices. So those are just a couple of things um, for, the, for the sort of region-wide approach. Hello, my name is uh, Jason Wallace. I just graduated from Tufts University. And I just wanted to ask, I was just on the website today, and you kind of mentioned it, but I, one of the things that I wish is that more of like the grants and scholarships were, there was more than one opportunity per year. Mm -hmm. Because there only being one opportunity, it kind of locks out people. Yeah. And in, return, in regards to strategic partnerships, <laughs> That's one of the things that I see about Boston as the most untapped resources is that there are so many brilliant minds, there are so many great institutions in this one area. How, how can we like foster more like collaborations and get more grants and scholarships mm -hmm. going in that way? Yeah, so first of all, congratulations. Um, did you already graduate or graduating in May? Graduate in May. Well, it, it, congratulations in advance. It's very exciting. I hope you stay here in Boston and build your creative career, career here. All right. Um, well, you know, we actually are um, our Boston Cultural Council for many years. The ordinance says one deadline a year, and we uh, are actually asking City Council to change that so we can have multiple deadlines a year. So we know that that's a problem. And because we have more grant funding, um, we're seeking to make that change. So we're really excited about doing that. Um, and then our artist resource website, the whole city um, website is getting redone. So our current website, we know, is really bad. 
The Boston Creates website is a little bit better, but eventually we're going to have a great website um, that will aggregate many more of these uh, opportunities together in one place, a little bit more of one-stop shopping. Um, there's no centralized call for artists in Boston. We know that it's really hard to find um, that information. So we're aiming to change that, and this is going to be something we'll do in our first year of implementation. So we're, we're trying. Definitely come to the AFTA convention. It's, it's way cheaper for students, and, and I think you'll find a lot of networking and uh, professional development opportunities there, June uh, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th. Great. I think there's a question right back here in the middle. Um, hi, my name's Rachel, and uh, I have a question about the residencies for artists. Um, I think everyone can attest that rental prices in Boston are fairly exorbitant, being like one of the third most expensive cities in the country, and it's very difficult for artists to maintain residence where most of the arts hub is. Um, and I think it's very important, clearly because it's up there, but um, because not only is it great for the artists and better for them to live near where they work and create, but it's also great for the neighborhoods themselves to have, you know, maybe not just finance people who are able to afford these rents, but the artists themselves. It makes for a very, very, excuse me, <laughs> a very um, creative, collaborative, interesting dynamic. Environment. So my question to you would be, if uh, I have a friend who has a pretty great idea for creating kind of a more localized uh, residence for artists program, and it's relatively small scale, but I think that every bit counts, um, what would be the best way to get that idea across <coughs> to you? Or yeah, so um, the question was about um, how to pitch an idea for an artist residency, a small scale artist residency, you're, you sort of jumped the gun a little bit because if you got your little piece of paper when you got here, at the end of the meeting, we were gonna ask you, how do you wanna help implement the cultural plan? <laughs> and so today, the best idea would be to write your idea on the back of your little piece of a paper and give it to one of my lovely staff who have the green t-shirts on before you leave or at the registration desk. So that's one way that you can let us know. Be sure you put your email or phone number on there. We'd love to work with you to sort of connect the dots on, um, on how to help make that happen. Um, or you could always submit um, an email to us through the Boston Creates website as well if you're not ready to do it right now tonight. So we'd love to work with you on that. Your friend, asking for a friend, yep, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think our Boston Creates email is, what's our Boston Creates email? It's, it's um, yeah, you can just also submit it through the bostoncreates.org website. Okay, perfect, thank you. Yeah, yep, there's a question right here. We have time for, I think, what, two more questions. Yes, how are you? Um, very briefly, uh, my wife is from Ivory Coast, West Africa, and she mentioned, and uh, I'm presently in Charleston, I grew up in Natick, and uh, I promise I won't go on that line because you said the last question, but um, uh, she's amazed with all the universities and the scholarship in the universities, how few people of color have high profile places in say radio, sports radio, she, she can't listen to sports radio or talk radio. So dismissive and so um, uh, mean spirited, she won't listen to it. And she's uh, missed as how few anchors, say, on the local TV have any true voice or, or and more to the point, I live in Charles, we live in Charleston. I get on the, the um, this very T stop and on the red line, I'm in the minority. It seems disproportionate to me. And um, uh, I'm Irish, and I, okay, sorry. But uh, I find it's disproportionate what places of power citywide, especially in our media, mm -hmm. are disproportionate. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have Michael Hawley mm -hmm. and some guys that follow the Celtics, and it's 
very limited. Yeah. I, I didn't know, uh, this is the dynamic, if you don't uh, yeah, sure. mind uh, bringing up. So we do have several members. Oh, the question was about, I think, a diverse representation of, of all of Boston's population in the media, high profile media. Um, but I think also what you're talking about is what we're talking about in goal five. Um, and we're, we're talking about um, having the arts and culture sector more accurately reflect the true diversity of the population of the city of Boston um, and really lifting up a lot of stories that aren't told or haven't been told, maybe need to be told again, um, and having people in positions of influence who look a lot more like the people of all of Boston. So that's really what goal number five is all about. Um, but I also wanted to say that in terms of the media, we do have a few members of the media in the audience tonight. Um, and I think that this is something, um, you know, on, on the radio, it's voices. So you don't know who, what, what do people look like? I don't really know. Um, but certainly on television, it's a factor. And then on our stages and in our concert halls, it is for sure a factor. Um, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, and part of it is to support that pipeline of kids in fifth grade through grammar school, through high school, through college, you know, keep, keep um, that pipeline, build that pipeline and keep them here, right? And make sure that our cultural sector really reflects who we are as a city. So it's a big part of what we want to accomplish. We have time for one more question. I think let's go right behind him here. We'll have another, another part of the presentation where we can answer questions. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Sarah Ting, and I head up an organization called World Unit Inc. First of all, I want to really thank you. I know you put a lot of work into this and all the people who have worked behind you. The question that I have is, if we're going to bring some new, fresh ideas, which I think you're striving for, how do we break through and give other organizations an opportunity to receive funding other than the traditional big institutions, which we all know I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. How do we bring fresh, truly fresh, innovative ideas that are about addressing issues of diversity and inclusion and letting the arts be a way to lift our consciousness around diversity mm -hmm. and inclusion. Mm -hmm. Because quoting Albert Einstein, you cannot solve a problem with the same consciousness that created. Yeah. You must stand on a higher ground. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so the question is really about how do we, how do we solve the problem of inclusion? Um, giving small organi smaller organizations a chance. And I think you talk about innovation as well. And this is something that we found. Um, innovation is part of the brand, the DNA of Boston. And yet there's research um, about the cultural sector, the nonprofit cultural sector in particular, a study issued a couple months ago by the Boston Foundation, which looks like we're underfunding innovation pretty dramatically in the city of Boston. But I think it's a question of intention and intentionality and really being innovative in how we um, go about uh, funding organizations for innovation in new ways. How do we reach, you know, and this is, this is the work of implementing the cultural plan. This is for us to figure out. Um, I do want to move on to the next section and sort of get you guys um, ready to tell us your opinions. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what will success look like? How will we know we're successful? Um, and this has been informed by a great deal of research on creative vitality, cultural <coughs> vitality, and several, several studies distilled down into several key concepts. 
you know, if we're successful in implementing this cultural plan, we hope to have a city of Boston with creatively engaged youth, families, individuals, and communities. We want to have a strong pool of artists and creative entrepreneurs who stay and can, and can stay in the city. We want to have an active marketplace for arts, culture, and creativity. We want to have sustainable arts and culture institutions and venues. We need to have supporting civic municipal, municipal policies and goals. And finally, to have active use of arts and creative enterprises to animate and problem solve in all aspects of public life. That's the Boston we're envisioning for the future. All right, so now remember we took that, that, that poll, we're gonna ask you to weigh in. Um, tell us which goal represents your experience in Boston. Which of the five goals resonates the most strongly to you, is most urgently aligned with your opinions? Is it integrating arts and culture and civic life? Is it the need for fertile ground? Is it the need to support artists and keep them in Boston? Is it partners, unlikely and likely, um, and finding those resources? Or is it about equity and access? So take your device or your piece of paper, <laughs> and you can just go ahead and vote. Ugh, which one to vote for? You can only vote for one. I'm gonna vote. All right, just put the letter and hit send. And we can see how it turns out. Uh, let's see if it works. Oh, yay! Now you can vote. Now you can vote. Oh, you have to do it again? You can't vote on that poll. Okay, let me go again. Did you get the error message? Yeah. All right. Now you can go. Whoa. All right. Live results. All right. Just as a reminder, arts and civic life, Fertile ground, supporting artists. Uh oh, number two is really partners and resources or equity. It's funny how it moves around, right? Oh, you have a question. Quick question. So, yes, fertile ground is about creating. Now you're testing my memory, right? It's really about creating. Um, an ecosystem where new organizations can start up, mid-sized groups can grow, um, that we remove barriers to organizations, have plenty of funding, um, create partnerships that develop platforms and funding streams and networks that enable risk-taking, strengthen small and mid-sized organizations municipal policies that are supportive and not onerous. That's really what fertile ground is about. It's a little bit conceptual. All right, is everybody done voting? Oh, one more question. I'm gonna get a, a message. Your presenter, Jill Blackwell, has not opened the poll yet. Does that mean that? Mm -hmm. That's the wrong one. Oh, yeah. oh, I think you're on the wrong poll. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I think you might be, yeah, someone next to her, help her out. <laughs> a young person, I'm sorry, that's not nice. Um, believe me, I needed my secret weapon also. All right, so that's pretty interesting, pretty even. I guess I'm not that surprised by that. All right, let's take the next one. A little bit of a similar question for you. Which goal do you think is most important for Boston? So the last question we asked about what do you think for you, now you're gonna put on your civic hat and think about the whole city, the wider city, long range. Which goal do you think is most important for the whole city of Boston? 
Whoa. All right. Which one do I think is I'm going to vote? All right. Remember, you just have to put the letter. Um, whoa. <laughs> That's interesting. All right. Did everybody vote? All right. Now, the next question. <coughs> Let me just stop moving. Um, so which goal do you see yourself playing a role in making a reality? And we didn't put none of the above. <laughs> you got to choose one. Um, and I think I have to go to the next slide to open it, right? OK. Now the voting, whoa. All right. Which one am I going to do? All of them. I'm going to be working on all of them. I should have put all of the above. Um, all right, I'm going to go. All right, just put the letter and hit send. Did she get it hooked up, this lady over here? No, not working. All right. Yes. Will this be on the website? This presentation will be on the website. Will the voting be on the website? I don't know. We probably could do that. No, it's not going to be on the website. Okay, this is it. Speak now or forever hold your peace, as they say. All right, partners and resources. All right. Um, so, I think we have some time. All right, the polling went a lot faster than we thought it would. <laughs> All right, so what are some next steps? Um, I did mention earlier in the presentation that we've got scholarships open for City of Boston certified artists and grantees of the Boston Cultural Council. Those applications are up. Um, if you just go to the Americans for the Arts website, you'll find them. Um, we have a facility survey that, that was supposed to close today, and we think we're going to um, expand the answers through um, the first. The draft plan, we're going to take your feedback. Um, the draft plan for public comment will be posted on our website. We think in late April or May. We're just not 100% sure on the dates yet. Um, and the final plan will launch in mid-June, coinciding with the Americans for the Arts Convention. Um, we do have time for more questions. I know that there were more hands that were up um, while we were asking questions. So we definitely have time for several more questions. Okay, and why don't we go up this hallway? So why don't we? I think there was a question right here. Hi, my name is Victor Janella. I am an individual artist. I don't represent any group or organization. And I would like to ask you a question, which is very important for individual artists about art placement. There is nothing more painful for an artist to see your art collecting dust, basically. Mm -hmm. So I have many works which were exposed to the public in uh, exhibitions and shows, and every time they just come back to my basement. Mm -hmm. One of my pieces going to, uh, to New York, actually, in May, selected by Metropolitan Museum of Art. And I'm just wondering where it will go when it comes back. Mm -hmm. I believe it's going to be at my basement. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that that you're trying to make city officials more available to talk to individual artists. Who is that city, city official I can talk to? Mm -hmm. and when and how? Well, I know you and I have talked yes. on several occasions. Yes, you remember um, probably one And of, I know that you have talked pieces. to my staff. Yes. So the question is, who can, see, who can individual artists talk to? That's right, yes. And so this is the whole intent behind creating 
an artist resource. Oh, I do. Uh, before I before I go on, I do want to let people know that if you specifically want to be involved in helping implement the cultural plan, put it on the back of your piece of paper. And then we do have video stations on the way out if you want to talk about um, on camera your reactions to any of the five goals or strategies. We'd love to have you tell us. So just a little plug as people are filtering out. Um, so for individual artists, there is going to be the artist resource person in my office. So in addition to all the staff I have, right now all my staff help out, but it'll be one dedicated specific person getting you information, helping you figure out who to talk to. Um, but then there's also, I think we should be really clear that one of the things we're trying to achieve is you know, one of the measures of success is an active, I mentioned, an active marketplace for arts and culture. And an active marketplace includes somewhere for musicians to figure out how to get bookings, right? Help for an artist to figure out how to either get a gallery, maybe open up a cooperative gallery, have a website where you can sell your work, so that marketplace is meant to help um, individual artists as well as organizations find the ways that they can bring in revenue <laughs> and thrive financially. We know how challenging it is for individual artists. The other thing we're looking to do with our grants to artists is not only support your ability to make your creative work, but also help you go through workshops uh, for professional development so that you can access some of that professional support that maybe would help you get to the next stage in your career. Um, we're also looking at how can our grants to individual artists um, help you build sort of not only your professional development and your creative projects, but how to learn how to share your work with the public, perhaps as a teaching artist, um, in the schools, in a senior center, in a community center. So we're really looking at a variety of ways to help individual artists. But that's not to say that that it's you know going to be everything to everyone. We still know how difficult it is to make it as an artist, and I just want to acknowledge that. So thanks for your question. Thank you, Julie. Yeah. And I think, Ellen, if we go straight up. Okay, well, we'll get, we have plenty of time. Let's get two over here and then we'll come down this row and we'll, we'll get the ones there. You have to be patient. We want, we have plenty of time for everyone to have, ask their question. Hi, right, good question. Is Austin creates looking into partnership with the uh, corporate community? Yeah, the question was, is Boston Creates looking into partnerships with the corporate community? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> we've, been, we've been meeting with corporate funders, corporate foundations, um, who already have a philanthropic arm, and we're always interested and um, eager to meet with um, partners. We do think we're going to be able to create a couple of partnerships or um, collaborative efforts to implement the plan that would be particularly appealing to corporate partners. But yes, we're very interested in that. And if you have any specifics in mind, write them on your piece of paper. We would love to follow up with, with any ideas that you might have. And then we'll do one more on this side, then we'll come, we'll come down that hallway and we'll do, we'll do the questions on this side. I'm very curious about the use of the dead spaces in Boston. Dead spacing meaning like pop-up galleries that in December you'll see this building will give out for a month to artists and then for 11 months let it sit empty. You know, the artists could utilize that space. The BCEC will have a big convention there and only use half of it and the rest is empty. They'll hang art on the walls but those rooms are underutilized. It could be performance spaces, it could be rehearsal spaces. Things like that, the dead spaces that shift and shift. Downtown Crossing has a lot of real estate that's just empty. You know, <laughs> somebody, somebody owns that building. And it's not really hard to, you, artists don't have a hard time utilizing those spaces until they get sold, mm -hmm. you know, basically. 
You can still sell that property if it's being sold as long as you don't let it yeah. do it. But those dead spaces that sit there and are essentially an eyesore, mm -hmm. why aren't yeah. those being utilized yep. more? So yeah, the, the, the comment really was about how, or maybe the question is how to make better use of spaces that are empty, underutilized, and really we would very much encourage people who have a space to fill out the Performing Arts Facility Survey, people who need space to fill out the survey, because we do intend to match make and come up with systems for using spaces that are underutilized. Not easy, very multifaceted, but for, for example, in Downtown Crossing, we have a fantastic organization who could serve as that intermediary, and as a matter of fact, they often do. Um, and this is the, um, the Downtown Crossing Business Improvement District, who you know helped, um, during Fashion Week, helped an organization to use an empty sixth floor sort of raw space in an office building. It was a really cool event space. So part of, the, part of the issue is to inventory the need and inventory what's available, but then to also have um, intermediary groups who can come up with a system. Another great example is our wonderful Main Street organizations who often can play that role of intermediary so they can sort out the relationship with the landlord and the insurance and the agreements. Um, I think the intermediaries are, are great to have to, to make it um, not just an accident, but, but a system that we, and that's something that we would work on. Um, the whole intent for Boston Air Round 2 being in the Boston Center for Youth and Families is we think that this is an incredible infrastructure uh, that could be better used um, and more fully play a role in the cultural life of, of their neighborhoods. The same goes for other civic spaces like libraries. Most every library has a community room and fantastic space that can be used for a variety of purposes. So. Where we love that idea and are looking for how to, to build those systems. So I think we're going to come down on this side of the room. Question: We have an arm, and then we'll we'll get your questions here. Hello, uh, thanks for sharing your goals. Um, I am curious. You said that there's no set priority or uh, order for those, but I'm wondering if you could take just a little bit of time to speak to how those goals do interact with each other. Are they, is one a foundation for the others? Do you see them as access points for those who are not in this room um, to engage with the plan? And then I'm generally curious about what conversations around metrics for the success factors have been discussed or identified mm -hmm. so far. Yeah, great question. So the question is about the interrelatedness of the various goals. We, we recognize there's a tremendous amount of uh, kind of interrelatedness. So that if you have systemic dollars for change and fertile ground, you're better able to keep artists. So they do definitely relate to each other. You could probably easily move one strategy from one goal into another goal. And we've painstakingly done that back and forth. Um, over the last several weeks. Um, we felt like we got things in the right place, but we're always interested to hear how maybe we could improve that. Um, so they're very highly, um, very highly interconnected, and what comes first, what comes next. Um, there's a lot that we're, we're doing that's opportunistic, so what might come first are things that we have funding for, partners that come together sooner, um, rather than later. Um, there's a lot of research, we think, and deeper dives and more due diligence that needs to happen to really understand how to build systems and put solutions into place. So some of that research and those deeper dives are going to need to come first to inform our efforts. That's one of the reasons why we went ahead and did the um, Performing Arts Facility Survey and study, we knew that that was an issue. We knew that that would greatly inform what we could put into place as a solution or tools. So, um, and then I think you asked about metrics. 
and we are looking at metrics. We've been talking a lot about metrics. Um, and then again, data is really important. So when we talk about keeping artists in Boston, we recognize that we don't have great data on who's leaving and why are they leaving. Um, so that's, that's some of the metrics that we're looking at. Um, again, the Boston Foundation study that I mentioned earlier is a great foundational piece of existing conditions from, for the, of the nonprofit sector from sort of the funding and financial perspective. And something we might look at are metrics tied to the financial health of nonprofits. I don't think the for profits would disclose their financial health to us. So, some of the metrics is what's available um, and what exists. We know that there are metrics that every separate school keeps on where their graduates go and end up and what they end up doing. It's a matter of accessing that data and aggregating that data. So, metrics is something that we're deeply investigating. Um, I would say that we have been throughout the whole plan process and looking at my staff. So um, that'll be in the final, the draft of the plan will be our, our initial thinking on metrics. And we certainly do intend to report back on how we're doing um, every year on how, how we've accomplished the goals that we've set out and what up what, and sort of then reporting on some of those metrics. But we definitely need to put some systems into place. So that, there you go on metrics. And then I think there were some very eager hands. Alan, oh, up there. OK, and then we'll come down. Hi, I'm Jessica. And thanks for organizing this forum tonight. Um, I work at A26 Boston, which is a writing and publishing I know A26 Oscar. Boston. We They're a great you. organization. <laughs> Thank you. And I noticed at the beginning, um, when we did the poll, there's a menu of creative expressions, but writing was not on there. Oh, and but literary. We yeah. had literary. Did we not have literary? Yeah. 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 <gasps> and um, so, I mean, I checked off culinary yeah. arts personally, but professionally I'm here because... <laughs> we couldn't, we couldn't, yeah. That was a test question. No slight intended. <laughs> well, um, I mean, while we're on the topic, I'm, yes. I'm curious, given that wasn't you know it wasn't on the screen tonight good to hear that it will be next time what the city's priorities are around supporting youth and, and writing yeah um, so the question is about why wasn't literary on the creative expression poll question fair you, you the fair question our oversight not intentional I think I had it literary on an earlier version uh, um, okay um, so uh, and then the question was about supporting literary um, arts for youth. And uh, we do definitely some grant making in that space. I know that um, E26 and Grub Street get grants from the city. Um, let's do a few more organizations. And um, we really think actually programmatically through our Poet Laureate program um, is probably the most visible and tangible evidence of how Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture works in that space. Um, we're not a big provider of direct programs. It's really uh, other actors who will take the lead in executing programs. Um, but the Poet Laureate um, is working with youth to, to see if we would have a youth poetry program attached to the Poet Laureate. I can't remember. You, poet Ambassadors, I think it's called. We're, we're developing that concept. Um, so it wouldn't be a Youth Poet Laureate, but something like a Youth Poet Laureate, but not, not a laureate. Um, words are very important when you're working in the literary space. Um, and then the other thing we're doing is hosting the Louder Than a Bomb finals on May 6th at the Strand Theater. You are all cordially invited to join us. It's gonna be amazing. Um, so those are just a couple of the ways that we've been able in the last year to support youth literary, um, but probably through grant making and partnerships is one of the biggest ways we would continue to support it. You know, the other thing that is this enormous area of possibility is how all of our universities could work together to more um, 
closely work with the public schools and younger kids. We have the incredible model of the Boston Arts Academy uh, being founded as a result of several universities wanting to have a pipeline of young people to go to um, schools in the performing arts at a professional level. And so perhaps there's another sister collaboration <laughs> that we could copycat from the BAA, perhaps. Um, that, might, that might take some time to incubate and land, but it, it could be pretty exciting. Um, and it's a way to think about leveraging our incredible universities in ways that really help the youth in Boston. Okay, let's come down here and get some questions. Uh, so it definitely seems like you found in all of the surveying and conversations that the cost of living can be prohib prohibitively expensive for people, but I think it's important to remember that it's not just housing costs alone with a transit system that is continuously cutting service and raising costs. Um, personally, I don't know how many peers I have who went to college in Boston with me who also don't have prohibitively expensive student loans to pay off. Um, so for, for young people to be involved in the arts in this city, no matter what their discipline, the cost is so much more uh, you know, varied than just housing. And there definitely has been a lot uh, about creating housing and live, live and workspace for artists uh, who require that workspace for their medium. But, as a, an arts administrator, do you guys have any planning for support roles for the arts to ever have any affordable housing uh, in a similar nature? I don't feel like I've ever seen information about that and maybe just because an administrative role is a little bit more uh, structured than necessarily being like a freelance role or, or uh, you know, that type of career. Um, I don't feel like it's necessarily, uh, you know, not worthwhile to also create something like that for people who, mm -hmm. who do work in early career support roles. Because mm -hmm. um, yeah. all of the friends that I have in similar positions have left Boston for similar reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question was really about um, aff affordability of the city beyond housing costs and affordable housing for creative people who are in, I would say, allied creative fields, arts administration. And um, it may be that there are multifaceted aspects of the cost of living that are really high, but housing is one that we know that public policy and the city government um, has a housing plan that is intent on addressing it. We have tools we can bring to the table. Um, there are other aspects of the cost of living where city government doesn't have as many tools to bring to the table. Um, I think your point is a really good one about creative people. Um, we've always talked about um, artist housing. I always think of it as artist units because we know that perhaps people in the literary field they don't need you know, a big warehouse space for big canvases um, because they're writing. They need a quiet workspace and musicians need a different kind of space. So we talk generally about artist units because it might be an affordable um, dwelling. It might be a separate affordable workspace. It might be a separate allied affordable production or access to tools. So we know that um, space to create is very multifaceted. But for us in the city government, um, you know, one of the things we can focus on is housing. And it is going to be one of the things we focus on, whether it's just plain old units, live work units. Um, work units, work only, that, that is something we're going to focus on. It's going to take time to bring the resources to the table. It's going to take some research to understand, quantify the demand, um, and what kind of partners we can bring together. But I think um, it's a good point to look at our arts administrators, part of the certified artist definition. And I actually don't know that they are. Um, so it's a good point that you bring up. Julie. My name is Lauren Pellerano Gomez. I 
just moved here from Miami two months ago. Um, after four years in Boston, I mean, uh, four years in Boston in undergrad, and um, <coughs> so the last four years were in Miami, New York. So thinking of Boston as a potential arts capital, I was wondering if you could tell us about some specific initiatives that are in place to bring more people into Boston, to encourage them to stay, and to have this conversation on a national level. So in Miami, mm -hmm. the art fairs, of course, are fueling that. New York has a long history of, of being seen as an arts capital. What, what are we doing um, on the city level um, to make Boston have this presence mm -hmm. nationwide? Yeah, this is something we talk about in the plan, and it's a strategy to grow the cultural visitor, um, but we don't have any specific programs to announce at this point. So this is something that we're still working on and convening our stakeholders and seeing like what are, what are some of the first steps and what are the actions. So we're not quite there yet on that part of the plan. If you have ideas, it would be great to hear. I know that um, Art Basel just mentioned, just just um, published a piece talking about wanting to create um, a whole network of creative capitals and doing programs in other places, which is really interesting and exciting. Um, so if you have specific recommendations and ideas, we would love to know that. It would be very helpful for us. Uh, my name is Joe. I work uh, in the forward design industry here in the city. Um, and historically, Massachusetts has been huge in manufacturing, both apparel, footwear, um, and just products in general. And even today, we have half a dozen world headquartered companies, um, you know, New Balance, Converse, Puma, Reebok, Heads, uh, you know, all over the place. Um, and in the last 20 years, we have a lot of, you know, mill towns, Lawrence, Lowell, Fall River, that have been rapidly shrinking in manufacturing jobs. Um, and I wanted to know if that's part of something you guys are looking at to engage not only a fertile ground for people to create, but for that to kind of compound out into more jobs and engaging um, these roots that we really have in New England and in Massachusetts specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question was about how can we build on our history as a textile and manufacturing center and capture um, the 21st century manufacturing that's a result of, I guess, our apparel brands who are here in Boston. It's a great question. Um, and I know that there are several funders who were really interested in exploring the maker movement, maker space, sort of the high tech manufacturing, and how we can have that be um, capture the growth in that sector here. So. We're definitely talking to people about that. Um, I don't know that there's a lot of room to capture that growth within the city of Boston. It might be a more regional New England um, effort. I do know that NIFA, New England Foundation for the Arts, uh, just issued an RFP for a creative economy study. Um, that's how the artist census is gonna get done as part of that. So NIFA is going to be looking at that sort of New England wide. So I think that we might be able to put together some really interesting supports, fertile ground, to make that a reality. But research is going to be the first part of that. Hi. Um, so my name is uh, my name is Kalila, and I run a creative organization called Poetic Change. And um, I mean, I've just been listening, and it seems like. Uh, some of the things like that's been said is that um, we want to create better systems to better support artists. But we've also agreed that the problem is that the current systems in place have not worked because they are the ones that are responsible for, uh, for, for rents rising and not cultivating diverse or, or, or representative art. Um, it also sounds that, uh, like your plan, includes to not take responsibility or, or, uh, or ownership for changing this dynamic, but instead to ask us to trust um, a, a uh, to trust a new pipeline or system that will be created with those already in power, such as um, such as like different business uh, like business associations. Um, so my question is, what is the specific role for Boston Creates and the Cultural Council? Are are um, so are you all um, more of a research agency? 
um, because I think the best way to improve the arts ecosystem is to work with an independent organization that is representative of, 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 all, of, the, of all of the different Boston communities. Um, so that way we can create something that, that, uh, uh, that is a bit more inclusive. Um, so what do you think about that and who will actually be doing the work? Mm -hmm. So the question was really about who is doing the work of implementing the cultural plan and in developing the goals, strategies, programs, actions in all of this, our question to ourselves is what's the role of the city? What's the role of the city? And for part of the plan, the role of the city will be to own and fund and carry out a certain function. So the artist resource desk in person that will be located within the mayor's office of arts and culture. Um, there's a whole host of other um, programs to implement the plan where the city is a partner. And the partners with the city can be very multifaceted. We're still working on what that looks like. There's another role for the city to play as catalyst, right? So we're um, at the table. We're not necessarily setting the table. And to be perfectly honest, we are expecting that a whole nother um, set of actions, programs, things that get carried out are completely owned by independent external to city government actors that are wholly owned by maybe a community organization or an arts organization. But it's one of the reasons we're really interested in you telling us how are you interested in helping implement the cultural plan? You know, it might not be a partnership. You might not want to have anything to do with city government, which I totally understand and respect and honor. Um, but we want to we want to um, support your efforts and know about what you're doing. And if you don't want to work with the city, that is completely fine. But we know that to implement the cultural plan, it's going to take every single permutation of city partners. You know. Um, uh, coalitions and um, collectives and external community base, all of the above. It's going to take all of it to make the cultural plan a reality. Hi, uh, my name is Sean Boyle from Chalsea. Um As you probably know, Chalsea has been going through like a big gentrification process for, uh, since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. um, in response to that, like three years ago, I started this uh, grassroots organization um, whose mission was to you know unify and beautify the town and to preserve and promote um, the Charleston culture and traditions and history. Um, and since then, we've like planned a lot of uh, events. We've um, really just unified the town. We've had all sorts of uh, different residents help us with all the events we've done. We've resurrected tons of events that have, um, that have been dead and long gone, and we've uh, introduced them to the new generations in Charleston. So I just want to know like what I can do to help this like Boston create so that like my thing in Charleston is like grows and becomes successful like will you guys help me and how can I help you guys yeah wow um, so the comment the question is how can his organization be part of implementing a cultural plan um, and maybe what can we do to help you and I think we're asking um, where do you see alignment between your goals and where you're headed and what you've heard about today in the cultural plan um, and to let us know what you're working on. A big part of um, the resource office is to be sure that we connect people with you um, and that we support your effort. The other thing we've started doing and we intend to continue is collaborative programs, meaning to foster um, people connecting up and working together. So um, we've had two of them where we've invited all of the Main Streets, all of the Boston Creates community team chairs to a meeting to share information or learn about opportunities at Art Week, Design Week, Pianos Everywhere, Out of the Box, any place that's going to have an open call for participation. Um, we're having this platform where people can work together. So we would be happy to work with you to offer that platform to other artists and organizations to get involved with what you're doing and then to um, see how they might uh, be a partner with you or vice versa. So 
we are developing a model for sort of collaboration that we think actually could be a way to break through these silos and help independent actors work together to carry out the cultural plan or just reach their own goals. So definitely tell us on the back of your sheet what you're doing. And let's take maybe two more questions. Hello, Julie. Alberto. Um, good to see you. Uh, it's a wonderful event and it's a wonderful opportunity to uh, share our thoughts. Um, as we were all aware, the arts and culture have a direct relationship to health and well-being to us individually and us as communities as well. Uh, I'd be very interested in knowing how we can work to incorporate the ability of the arts and culture to contribute to the overall population health in the cultural plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, as you know, um, people who work at the intersection of arts and healing have been meeting and talking about how can they work together more fully, um, bring people who are missing to the conversation, um, and see what's possible. So I do think that through Boston Air, um, we can explore how arts and other sectors work together. Um, we would love to talk to you more about that. I don't have any solutions other than to recognize that arts and healing play a huge role in resilience, in um, cutting across silos, helping people to more fully explore their creative expression. Um, we haven't landed any specific collaborations yet. We've just, um, um, we've just submitted a grant to the NEA to explore how music can be used in trauma recovery, just a very specific program. Um, but in terms of the sort of whole overarching, um, it's maybe partially communications, partially um, a collective impact uh, uh, partnership that involves public health and the university. So there's a ton of possibilities, but I don't have any specific answers yet in sort of what direction that we're going in. Hello, Julian. Uh, thank you for everything. This was uh, amazing. I just want to say my name is Igor Scott. Um, shameless plug. I have this uh, Facebook group called Boston Art Events. There's 1,800 yeah. members plus. And it's a really good place for you um, to see local art events in the city of Boston. And my question is, uh, a lot of artists come to you know, Boston for art school, and then they you know, leave school and they have a tremendous um, amount of debt. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know, it's hard to find a job, so some people change uh, professions or maybe they do something of art on the side, right? Um, do you think it's important for um, art, art, affordable housing to actually uh, consider the amount of student loan debt that people may have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. Do I, the question is, do I think it's important for affordable housing to consider how much student debt they have? Yeah, I also think it's important for employers to recognize it as part of, um, I know that Fidelity is starting to do this as part of the benefits package, looking at how they can help support people's, um, how much debt they have. So yeah, I absolutely think um, it should be considered and maybe it's something we can work on with when you qualify for um, a, a certain kind of a home buyer program. I think that they look at that. Um, I'm not a banker, so I don't know how all the details work, but yeah, I absolutely think um, it's a huge factor in how um, young people getting out of school are considering what path to take for their future. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Um, ah, yeah. Tell us your thoughts again if you're interested in being involved and put your contact info on it. And then also if you want to stop by a video station and have a little bit more of a platform, tell us about your reaction to the goals. Um, and we'll be using those snippets of video on our website to talk about all the different five goals over the next several weeks. So thanks everyone.